All right. We should be live ish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so tired. I am too. What a week. I uh I just like I can't believe how Bearishing hard Falcon Heavy EHT. Yeah. 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 It was uh it was a hell of a week. Um it's and it's so funny. I could just see this across the entire space Twitter sphere. Just everybody was exhausted. You know, everyone was just like, okay, you know, at, when the Falcon Heavy landed and it was like so exciting and then i was just okay i'm done <laughs> i'm done for now oh uh, elad avron's here oh elad i'm so sorry about your yeah i was so excited and then watching as watching mm -hmm. as the the speed of bear sheet as it was approaching the surface of of the moon was going higher and higher and its sideways velocity was not good you just knew i was watching we're Italy. still so proud we're yeah. so proud yeah. of everything you guys accomplished accomplishment, right first first spacecraft to make it to the uh like first private spacecraft to go into orbit around the moon and i feel like that's something that people just don't realize like everyone is saying it's it's israel's spacecraft and it was definitely a spacecraft built in Israel. In Israel. Right. But it's but it was a private effort. It was people yeah. coming together and building this this spacecraft to go to the moon. So I I'm uh, I I'd like to do a video on it now that, you know, I mean now we know what happened and and I want to really kind of get across that that I think we're in this new this new time where just enthusiastic people can come together and build something that can sort of inspire everybody's imagination and and take us to other worlds. So sorry about the little break, buddy. It sucks. Oh, I'm going to say hi to a bunch of people. Hello to Andy Cowley, Eris Echevarria, Arnold Post, Ben Kalo, Bertolt Todd, Bill Sugden, Bork Kleinkar, Chai Latte Nebula, Aylet Avron, Enoch, George Lancaster, Gordon Dewis, Graham W., Guido Bibra, Harry M. Hilg Berkog, Henrik Bo Anderson, Jebulani Williams, Janelle Duncan, Jessica Feltz, John Morrison, John Seffield, Johnny J., Kevin N., Kira H., Kylie Cerna, Lars Ray Yepsen, Leonard Clark, Linda Sadiq, Michael Jobin, Nets Graziano, Paranor, Ray, Raj Luthera, Rich901, Roger Haskins, Scott Astrophotos, Susie Murph, Ted Awesome, Thomas Tranaker, TJ Lipinski, Umu, and Zapfan Zapfan. Hey, everybody. We've got a big crowd today. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what we're going to talk about. Um, so hilariously here, we were going to talk about the black hole, but but it had a somewhat complicated title because there was sort of like putting it in context and all the other stuff that came around it so we're, we're not just gonna talk about the black hole we're gonna talk about a bunch of other stuff as well but but obviously uh, you know both of us have been neck deep in in talking about reporting on organizing coordinating building videos about uh, what happened this week so we wanted to take a, take a moment stop everything and uh, and talk about the uh, and talk about the black hole, and that and there was oh, now Pamela, you've got a couple of I was going to show off some other imagery. I mean, obviously there's the black hole, and I will apologize in advance for all the people who are who are listening to us because the picture obviously. But I'm hoping you've seen the picture. But there's a few other pictures that I'd like to show as well. Some great shots from Chandra. Uh, some zooming in shots from the European Southern. Do you have Korean Alex Parker's? Mark. No. Okay. I'll, so Alex Parker did a tweet that is that is everything that inspired me to do this All right. because um, there's been a lot of whining about how the image is fuzzy and why didn't they look at this in optical and people don't understand that this entire image is about 2% of a pixel on the Hubble Space Telescope's images. Yeah. Oh, here we go. All right, I will share this. Uh, I'll share this image right now so people can see. Uh, oh, 
gifts are terrible for this. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Yeah. So I'm sharing this right now. So one pixel in the Hubble Space Telescope. And then just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Boom. I have heard people say, you know, it's on the order of an orange on the moon, a golf ball on the moon. That's uh, that's really small. Yeah, it is awesome. Pamela, awesome. you're loud. I'm quiet. I've got you. We should be about the same. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the audio levels. So. Hmm. My, I need to be raised a little, apparently. All right. And what that really means is Pamela needs to be quieted a little bit. All right. All right. So, uh, Susie, I changed the, vo the, the title of the episode. So just keep an eye on that. We'll need to change that. All right. Are you ready to go? I I need one more image, uh, one more source opened. Hold on. So so he changed the title on me as well. Yes. So I had a different set of windows open and prepped. Um, so pardon while I sort. 40 micro arc seconds. So an, uh, a micro arc second is a tennis ball on, what's that how they work? A tennis ball on the space station? I forget the. Uh... The exact scale, but yeah, it's teeny tiny. Sorry, looking something up real fast. <laughs> One cannot simply quiet the Pamela. <laughs> okay, I think I'm ready. I I am now looking for Audacity. Audacity thinks it's ready. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to press record. I am recording. We did it. All right, here we go. What happened to my title? I don't know. Okay. Astronomy Cast, episode 526, the Event Horizon Telescope and the first image of a black hole. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you on this? Oh my God, did we get to sleep <laughs> yeah. science week? It has been the craziest week uh, in that I can remember in in recent uh, in my recent space journalism history. Obviously, the one that was all hands on deck was what is going to be the topic for today. Um, but we t uh, the bear sheet lander obviously crashed on the moon, which is sad um our thoughts <laughs> to all the people who worked on it and i really hope you take another crack at it um and of course the successful launch of the falcon heavy all three boosters landed successfully it was amazing the, it was amazing the the coverage the spacex coverage of of that whole mission was perfect except they lost the camera feed as the central booster was was landing and so it was like did it land did it land and then and then the the it cuts out and then you're like i don't know and then and then it cuts back and there it is standing on on of course i still love you so that was great and apparently they did is... catch or they they fished out the fairings from the ocean 
and so every part of this mission was full of wind. And and it is the most space sex thing ever that they lose the video just as it gets to the barge. It's it's like that is pretty much a given. It happens every time. Yeah, it's there's something clearly there's something that happens as the rocket is coming in. It jiggles the camera. It freaks everything out, and it they lose that moment of footage, and then and then they come back, and there it is. So that that's the one thing. SpaceX, if you're listening, if you can tune that one thing up, that would be fantastic. Just let us be able to see when the when the thing lands that's what i want but we still love of course i still love you yes um the uh, such nerdy sci-fi named uh drone ships is is so great all right today of course we're going to talk about the announcement from the event horizon telescope and the first photograph of a black holes event horizon pamela this is a conversation that is two years in the making it's been April 2017. Astronomers from around the world turned their radio telescopes towards the black holes at the heart of M87 and, of course, the Milky Way and took pictures of the black holes at the hearts of both of them. And today, this week, Tuesday, was it? We Wednesday? Anyway, the 10th, two days ago. Wednesday. I'm so tired. We got <laughs> that first picture announcement. So where were you when you saw it? I was in the attic of my house live streaming the event with our CosmoQuest community on twitch.tv slash CosmoQuestX, where you should all be watching and sharing yeah, live, live events. Streams. And uh, so we were hanging out, watching it together. And I don't know about you, but I had this moment of, okay, so they, they got us with M87 at the beginning. Yep. And and now we're going to have that Steve Jobs. Yeah, exactly. And- One more thing. But the thing was that never, ever happened. And, and I don't know about you, but about 15 minutes into the press conference, I started getting nailed with press releases coming to us from Rick Feinberg and his fabulous press service at the AAAS. And I'm flipping through them and I'm like, oh, expletive, there aren't going to be other images. This is it. Yeah. We only get M87. Yeah. And I sat there and I was like, the science matches perfectly. And I am sad because I wanted our Milky Way. <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> I know. That was literally, I'm like, this is great. Where's, where's, uh, where's Sag A star? Like, this is yeah. th- like, this was to be the consolation prize the main event the first course was supposed to be the black hole at the heart of the milky way and it's funny literally moments into this whole process i started to dig and talk to all of my contacts to try and figure out why so i do know probably kind of why which is so let's compare stories because i did the same thing great okay all right so so i'd heard two reasons um, the first one is that the um, that essentially the the there's a lot of dust in the Milky Way. We are inside mm-hmm. the Milky Way with the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, and so that dust is a, is a harder thing to tease out of the signal. And sort of the resolving distance of the Event Horizon Telescope sort of matched up uh, in a way that made it a tougher image to gather. But the second one that I love even more is that the the is essentially that because the you know Sagittarius A is a smaller black hole it's only 4.1 million times the mass of the sun it's the and matter is swirling around it so fast it's a much more dynamic environment and so they went with M87 because it is 6 billion times the mass of the sun and so the matter is swirling around it at the speed of light but it still takes days to go around as opposed to minutes to go around and so they were able to it was a everything happened more in slow motion they could test out their techniques and then try them out on on the supermassive black hole within the milky way what what did you hear I, I heard that, and then I also heard uh, one more facet to that, which is the angular size on the sky. So the apparent size that the black holes appear, because they're two different distances, means that Sag A star isn't really bigger, even though it's closer, because it's a tiny little thing. And so we don't really get 
added detail on the part that's luminous, luminous enough to see. Now, my personal hope is that because we're seeing a faster moving system and we're seeing a closer system where the luminosity of the innermost part of the accretion disk, we're not seeing the black hole, we're seeing the shadow of the black hole. My hope is that because that accretion disk is so much fainter, we're going to get to see other faint stuff around it that isn't lost to the bright stuff. So even though the black hole shadow itself will appear probably about the same number of pixels in size, I'm hoping that there's going to be other stuff in the image as well. Yeah, and and the other kind of exciting thing is that because it is changing so dynamically, there could be a possibility that we might see like an animation. Exactly. Right. We exactly. could see events unfolding over time to actually show uh, what's going on in this environment. So it sounds like, I mean, these two black holes, they are the biggest visually on the sky. They're both some ludicrously small number, 40 micro arc seconds or something like that. I, I've heard them yes. say, you know, the size of a golf ball on the moon, the size of an orange on the moon, very small but they yes. are both roughly the same size. It's just that the one at M87 is 2,000 times bigger and 2,000 times farther than the one at the center of the Milky Way. And and this is the kind of thing that, that all of us have come to understand, taking vacation photos when we fit the Eiffel Tower. I've never been to Paris, but when other people fit the Eiffel Tower in the palm of their hand, you just switch up what's closer and what's farther, and suddenly the smaller thing appears larger. Or in the case of the moon and the sun, the moon and the sun are two very different sizes, but they appear the same angular size in the sky. In the case of these two black holes, it's the same kind of effect. They appear roughly the same angular size in the sky, even though their physical sizes are radically different. Now, did you follow like the logistics of what it took to make this image at all? I followed some of it. I, I have to admit that that I squeaked with joy when they showed pictures of Haystack Observatory, which is where one of the correlation facilities is, because that's in my hometown and the first place I ever worked as an astronomer and earned money for doing astronomy. So, so Haystack Observatory, a radio facility up in Westford, Massachusetts, my hometown, is one of the places where they worked to combine all the data as well as the Max Planck, Max Planck Institutes. And uh, the, the bulk of this correlation of all of the data was done by Dr. Katie Bauman. And uh, there are some amazing pictures floating around the internet where they have racks of hard drives that contained all of the data that she worked on developing algorithms to combine all that data to get what we see. It is um, five petabytes yeah. of data, which will seem small once the largest Synoptic Survey Telescope exists. But today, yeah, that's a lot. seems like an amazing amount of, it, of data. Yeah, so there were eight separate telescope facilities around the world, several in North America, several, two in South America, um, a couple in Europe, one in Greenland, and one in Antarctica. And so for a week around April 2017, all of these telescopes every day um, sort of turned on the, the same objects in the sky and recorded their data to these hard drives and then all of these hard drives were were moved together to um to those facilities as you mentioned for further data processing and and then and actually it was four separate groups that were uh that worked on independently to produce their own separate images and they met and compared their results and saw that they all got the same thing so they sort of did peer review all at the same time and then, as you said, Dr. Bauman was the one who did the final sort of had developed the algorithm that would combine it all into this final image that we all saw. Um, and, and what I loved is, to me, it sounded so much like solving a problem set back in graduate school where you have all of this complicated steps and stuff and things that all have to get brought together in the exact right way or your final result is off in the fifth digit. And seeing how all these different all these different institutions worked their way 
through all of these different problems and then did like you do when you're doing a problem set and it's like okay everyone i got this number what did you get and and it's that consensus of oh wow most of us typed in the numbers the right way and all got the same answer that is the the yes we did this right verification um Science sometimes is a matter of, did you type it all incorrectly? And in this case, it's, did you write the software bug-free in the same way? And it's awesome to watch. So let's, let's assume that people have seen the picture or they have the picture in front of them. Um, when you look at this image, what are you seeing? I, so I personally see an angry clown smile, but that's sure. me. Yeah, I mean, there is definitely a group that is thinking that it is the angry clown's imaging telescope. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but what are the features that are in this image? Right. So you have a very circular uh, central dark shadow that is surrounded by an orange ring that is brighter in the lower regions in a slightly asymmetrical way that is what reminds me of an angry clown smile. So you can imagine clown smile, that is the shape of I the overly it. bright region in I the bottom. I definitely see it and can now never unsee it. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know what that's called when you share an image instead of a song and create a brain worm, but I think we have mastered it. Yeah. Uh, so those brighter areas down in the bottom uh, section of this image, that is where the material is coming towards the observer and you're seeing a uh, brightening in the, the source of uh, the fainter area. You don't have that Doppler shifting going on, so you don't have that added light. And what we're seeing is not the black hole. This is one of those things that has really annoyed me about the coverage. What we are seeing is the light from the accretion disk and the shadow of the black hole on that bright material. And this material is running at a right angle. It's running perpendicular to the amazing jets that uh, we can see in the Hubble images of M87 and that continue to stretch away the, from the galaxy in larger field of view radio images. And so I think that, you know, the features that are really spectacular here is we see that central, now, you know, it is not the black hole, but I mean, the, the black holes in there, that is the, essentially the event horizon, the part where the light is now trapped forever and and all the matter and all the light is trapped and then around that the donut is this is this material that's swirling around this accretion disk and as you said it's bright on one side because it's coming towards us and it's dimmer on the other side because it's moving away from us and and literally the the light is getting red shifted in brightness so that we can see more and and less of it. In fact, some of the light that you're seeing is actually happened on the other side of the black hole, and it is being pulled around by the gravity of the black hole so that you can see it. That's how tangled up space time is going on here. And and what is really amazing about this is this image is like Pluto orbit scales. We we are looking at a region that is 0 0.0019 of a light year. So this is the kind of thing that is light days across, not light years, light days yeah. across. These are scales we can start to like actually imagine and think about. And when we think of M87 in general, we're looking at these beautiful images of this large co cotton ball of a galaxy. And that large cotton ball of a galaxy is actually bigger than our own galaxy and is 32,000 parsecs across. <laughs> right. Um, now, let's talk a bit about the the wavelengths that went into this, because you're seeing a lot of people out there on the internet sort of you know and i think you're you know the you're being very careful to say you know it's not a photograph of a black hole i'm not being so careful um because it's in there there's a black hole in there we're seeing it 
Um, but it is a it is an image in radio waves, not in visible light. So, so why is that important? Well, it it's it's important because the black hole itself we don't know how big it is what we're seeing is the edge of the event horizon this was written in a way that is so good i'm going to quote it it was written by grant trembley who goes by at astro grant and he was reacting to the fact that many people have have been like oh why didn't they look at it in the optical this is just a fuzzy image because people don't understand the sense of scale on this and and what he wrote was I'm sorry that the image whose earth-sized baselines yielding a 20 milli arc second beam, beams how we discuss radio astronomy, um, yielding a 20 milli arc second beam resolving five short shield radii whose deconvolution placed 10 resolution elements over a 15 light day black hole shadow and photon ring in an object 55 million light years away was too blurry for you. Yeah. And and it's it's when you start to realize we're looking at a ring of light that is getting bent toward us by a black hole's event horizon 55 million light years away. That's kind of freaking awesome yeah yeah and i mean the i mean the, the whole reason that they went with radio waves like if they could have taken a visible light picture of this region they would have done it but we don't have the tech we don't have the technology to do it you the only way that you can make a telescope the size of the earth which is what they did is yeah. to take it in radio waves and, and so and you are seeing the radio emissions of the region around the black hole. That's probably not the most energetic part. It's probably, you know, the best picture would probably be like an X-ray or a gamma ray telescope looking at that region, right? Visible light would definitely show you all kinds of cool swirling stuff. Infrared, ultraviolet would be amazing in every wavelength, but radio is the one they could. And, and the reason for this is with radio receivers, we have the ability to go, there's a wave front, there's a wave front, there's a wave front, as the individual waves get to the planet Earth. And we have to align the data so that when we correlate it, you have the arriving wavelengths that hit each telescope lined up such that you're sampling the same wave front. This means they have to take into consideration the shape of the planet, which is determining the difference in distance for each telescope from the source. And even though it's 55 million light years away, that matters. Yeah. And then they have to like take into account that our silly planet has this nasty habit of rotating and that constantly changes the distance. And because our planet isn't perfectly round, it changes it in inconstant ways that have to be recalculated for each of the facilities. And this is hard. Yeah. And there were space-based telescopes working in different uh, wavelengths that got in on understanding the science on this. So if you watched the press conference, they highlighted some of the missions that were included in the scientific studies that took place. But they didn't use correlators to try and tie in radio data that was taken from space. And I got to thinking about this. And it's really hard to take into account the fact that our planet, which isn't perfectly round, rotates, and we have to calculate how the distances change over time. Well, spacecraft orbit really fast, and trying to correlate that in would have just been an additional special form of nightmare. Yeah. But what we did, I, I think the best word for me to describe this was this is a deeply satisfying piece of science. This is that feeling you get when you solve the stupid hard puzzle that it required you to find the three pieces the cat stole and put in different places in the house. And you succeed in finding the missing pieces and everything fits and it exactly matches the box. And you figured it would exactly match the box, but it's just nice when that happens. Like, again, the wavelength that they did this at is 1.3 millimeters. And so they had to align the wave fronts from all of these telescopes. And as you said, the planet is rotating. 
some of these these places they are moving towards the object and then they're moving away from the object as the earth is turning as the earth is going around its orbit around the solar system you've got a one you've got to line up all of these images that you take all this data that you capture have to be lined up to the 1.3 millimeter and otherwise and you're you aren't taking you aren't taking a picture with a telescope the size of the earth you are taking a telescope with one additional little radio dish it's a mind bending accomplishment uh, requiring as much computing power as much computing thought as the underlying astronomy and physics it's incredible and i haven't read the how they completed the image paper in detail uh, so i don't know if this is mentioned in it but with pulsar science, they actually have to take, in some accounts, the tides of the planet into account to get proper measurements, yeah. which means sometimes you have to not just take into account the fact that our planet is rotating, but you have to take into account that the height of mountains varies yeah. as the moon passes overhead. We don't think about how our own Earth is flexing with the moon's orbit and that that can muck up pulsar timings. Yeah. So these are all the crazy, amazing things you have to take into consideration. And we've done things like that before, but on different scales with VLBA and um, VLBI and all the other very long baseline add on the fourth word as you will. Um, but this was a new and fabulous implementation of the system. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, so what, I mean, we're probably going to be digesting this um, but for for years, and of course, we're waiting for the the Sagittarius A star image as well. But you know, putting this in context, you were talking a bit before about sort of how small this image is, and just in comparison to what, say, the Hubble Space Telescope could do. So we we have many of us fallen in love with this object because it has been studied across so many different wavelengths, creating fabulous dynamic images. Uh, we've been able to watch over time, seeing the knots of, of plasma move in the jet of M87. This is a fabulously dynamic system. And it's easy to lose the context of this black hole in all that data because it is so small that, that it, it's almost inconceivable. So let, let's work our way outwards. The black hole image, not the black hole itself, the image that we're seeing, the radius of that beautiful photon ring is a couple of percent of the size of a pixel on the Hubble image. Right. So the Hubble so, Space Telescope with a enormous CCD with one of the most sensitive lenses and instruments out there, one of its pixels, it is what fraction of it? It's 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 about 2% as, right. as near as I can tell. I, I need to math this out, but that that's about what I'm getting at. Right. Um, so So you have this little tiny region. Now, the, the Schwarzschild radius of this black hole that we're looking at is 0 0.0059 parsecs across. Now, that Schwarzschild radius is what is in the very core. Expand out a factor of a thousand, and you have at 0 0.12 parsecs, that's the size of the accretion disk around the black hole. So we've, we've already gone a factor of a thousand and, and we're still now like a couple pixels across in that Hubble image. <laughs> now, when you look at this Hubble image, there's these beautiful, well, a beautiful purpley jet superimposed on the main blob of this blobular elliptical galaxy. And that purpley blob that we're seeing is a plasma jet associated with, with the jets of material streaming out of the secretion disk. That plasma jet is 1.5 kiloparsecs. So we're now 
a factor of 10,000 larger than where we were a moment ago. And that's that inner purpley jet. Now, keep going and we get to the radius of the galaxy itself, which for the main star bulge part, not the full envelope, the main star bulge part is what I'm talking about. That's 32 kiloparsecs. We then have the radio jets. Those are 40 kiloparsecs. The extended halo around this elliptical galaxy is 150 kiloparsecs. And all of this is embedded inside of the Virgo cluster where M87 is the second brightest galaxy. And the Virgo cluster itself with its more than 1500 galaxies, it is 2.2 mega parsecs in radius. So, so when we're used to looking at these beautiful Hubble images of the Virgo cluster, and then zooming in on M87, and then zooming in on that plasma jet, we're still orders and orders of magnitude larger than what they were able to see with the Event Horizon Telescope. And, and I can see the Virgo cluster in, in a backyard telescope. Yeah, I can just make out M87. It's a Messier object. We've known about it for a while. You don't need a good telescope. You just need dark skies. You can see M87 in your backyard. But down, smaller than the eye can behold and most brains can imagine, that's what this team was able to image. Absolutely incredible. What comes next, do you think? I mean, obviously, we may have to have this conversation again when they release the image of Sagittarius A-star in the Milky Way. Yes. I think right now comes a whole lot of people sort of going, well, huh, it exactly matched relativity. That is a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Einstein and right again. Although he you know, didn't like the idea of black holes, but his calculations liked the ideas of black holes. Therefore, Einstein was right, even though he would prefer to not be right in this situation. And and all the folks that predicted black holes that Einstein didn't initially believe until his math forced him to believe it, they were all right. And this is just satisfying. And I think it's going to lead to a lot more confidence in our development of computer models of how does all the physics tie together across all the different scales for active galaxies like M87. We're going to start to say, yes, we have confirmed this about the, the black holes accretion disk. We have, we have confirmed this about the, the photon ring. We have, we have matched the innermost scale. And now let's build out and just explain all the physics on all the scales. And that is beautiful. And I, I really think like when you see some of the research papers out there that are making fairly uh, bold predictions or or even very conclusive results about things, it's on whiffs of, of data that they're able to yes. get the spectroscopy to this level of you know, tolerance from this one active galactic nuclei, and that tells them that this chemical is present in whatever, right? And X-ray this... and gamma ray astronomers count their photons, and some of them <laughs> even name their photons. Right. So, so this actually, when you see this blob with bright spots and faint spots, and and there's a ton of underlying data that that you don't see in the picture that astronomers have access to. It really does feel like they've got mountains to work with and use for their theories about black holes and relativity and accretion disks and jets and all of these things. Like, they're going to be busy. Ten resolution elements across the short shield radii. Yeah. Ten resolution elements, which is a fancy radio astronomy way of saying, uh, not quite ten pixels, but uh, something somewhat similar to that. That's the best analogy I can come up with right now. Uh, that That's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty good. We've all zoomed in on images until we were looking at a face that was only that many pixels apart. Yeah. 
Yeah, amazing, amazing. Well, uh, abs- congratulations to everyone on the Event Horizon team. 200 scientists, eight observatories, two years of work, uh, and we couldn't be happier with the results. Pamela, before we go, uh, do, you have, do we have some names this week? We have names because our audience is fabulous. So to thank our Patreons for April, I want to say thank you to Jordan Young, Barry Gowen, John Jorsk, Andrew Polstra, David Trog, Brian Cagle, the great, uh, sorry, the giant nothing, Ramji Amuthi, Robert Palsma, Corey Diwali, Joss Cunningham, Emily Patterson, Dana Nori, Joseph Hoy, Carton Sevra, Hulg Bork, Hog. I'm sorry. I adore you. Your name is hard. Uh, Bill Hamilton, Frank Tippin, Richard Riviera, Greg Thorwald, Les Howard, Thomas Sepstep, Laura Kittleson, Selvin Westby, Jeff Collins, Merrick Vildarni, John Drake, Nate Detweiler, James Platt, Elod Avron, Philip Walker, and I'm going to start stop there, and we will get to the rest of you next week. Awesome. Thank you. You are what allow us to pay Susie, keep the servers going, and keep bringing you this science. Thank you. We are enabled by you. Thank you. And thank you, Pamela. We'll see you all next week. Bye-bye, everyone. All right. Just got to save. Okay. Five twenty-six. Yes. Okay, and I'm going to save it in the correct directory this week. Last week, I decided to save it in the wrong directory just to confuse Susie. Well, mission accomplished. (laughs) I'm sorry, Susie. I adore you. I just sometimes have a stupid. Yeah, no, we all do. Mostly me. Uh, (laughs) I think I'm the one who (laughs) has Susie pulling more of her hair out. Uh, Chad Lade Nebula says, is Chad still around? Haven't heard about him lately. Chad is going to be my special guest on Monday on my Open Space show where we're going to talk about production on our on our work for my YouTube channel. Uh, Chad, Susie's doing the editing, but Chad is – or Susie is doing the editing for Astronomy Cast, but Chad is still the editor over with me on my YouTube channel. So you'll get a chance to meet Chad and talk to him. So that'll be fun. Monday. We, we share humans. Yeah. We share humans across our projects. And as we fill their schedules, we essentially, for those of you who speak server, we load balance. <laughs> yes. Um, Graham W. asks, is the material in the accretion disk of M87 the remnants of a star? I We have no way of knowing. It could be gas, dust, remnants of planets, remnants of stars. I, it is most likely just like normal everyday gas and dust that went on a bad orbit and had a bad trip. Right. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Quad Limit says, Fraser, thank you for the black hole photo that you finally approved for the press release. Still waiting for the Sagittarius one that you're keeping in my desk drawer. Uh, yeah, the, the joke on my channel is that people just keep asking me when we're going to get that picture. Like, I have some kind of control over it. I do not. I, I, do. I, I like, raged at my my computer when I realized there would be no Sag A-star. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, it was just, like, an unfolded in just slow motion. You're like, no. Larry Beckham asks, what's the closest stellar black hole can they uh, image it? Uh, Cygnus X. Cygnus X1? Yeah, you're right. Do you still think that's the closest black hole? Because that's like one of the first black holes that we knew about. Let me see. I'm bad at remembering these things. Fraser's remarkably better at remembering these things. Uh, I don't think it's still the closest. Like, it's the first. And it it was in a binary object. Yeah. Yeah. They're hard to find when they're out by themselves. We call those naked singularities. If they have a friend, they can gravitationally affect it and get seen through the companion's motion. And they can also consume the companion's material, which can get seen. 
So the closest one is called A0620-00, which is at the V616 mon. So mon V616 monoceros. Right, so that means it's a variable star, so it has an accretion disk. Right, that... and so the idea is that it's in a binary star system, and it's a candidate. Okay, Yeah. cool. And then the next one is Cygnus X1 at 6,000 light years. So that one is at 3,000, but the definitely certain one is the one that's 6,000. So it's kind of amazing that the pretty much the first black hole ever found is still pretty much considered the, the close one. And, and there's a massive size difference between these stellar mass, there, there's an astronomical size difference between these stellar mass black holes and the supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. So on the list of things I still need to math, I'm pretty sure that Sag A star is going to be significantly larger in arc seconds or fractions of an arc second across the sky than either of these other nearby black holes that are stellar mass. Yeah. I can't find anything that tells me the size of the event horizon and accretion disk around Cygnus X1. Okay. So... Now, we had a lot of people ask, asking, like, why, like, when James Webb flies, can it join the Event Horizon Telescope? No. No, for so many reasons. Uh, so, so reason one, it's not a radio telescope. It looks at things in the infrared, which is a much shorter color of light. You still can't see it, but if you take a prison and you divide the sunlight out into a rainbow and you take a thermometer and put it right beside the red line of the rainbow, you can watch the thermometer warm up as infrared light that you can't see with your eyeballs heats up your thermometer. Now, radio wavelengths, uh, these, these are longer wavelengths. These are closer in size to the ones that you use to vibrate water molecules in your microwave. I saw a fabulous experiment done by Carolina, uh, Carolyn Odman uh, Govner down in South Africa where she took Papadon and put it in her microwave after removing the thing that spins your food. And the Papadon popped up wherever the magnitude of the light was maximal. Uh, right, so you, so you can measure wave. the wavelength of the light. Yeah, you can measure <laughs> the, the wavelength bread. of the microwaves with the bread. It's fabulous. That is incredible. I can do this with marshmallows, but marshmallows you then have to clean up. Right. And I've never wanted to do that to a microwave. Yeah. But um, pop it on. Yeah. We all need to be more multicultural in our science demos. It and then people awesome. have also been asking, why can't we just take – all of the visible light telescopes on Earth and in space and have them all be one big telescope like the Event Horizon Telescope. So this goes back to where I said that with radio telescopes, we have the ability to record on a hard disk that can get mailed uh, the the peaks and troughs in, in the radio waves and shift those around in software to align the information. Unfortunately, with, with infrared inter interferometry, optical is one of those pie in the sky, we're still sorting out how to make it work. Um, it becomes a mechanical problem because we can't measure with our sensors those peaks and troughs. So what we have to do is shift the, the travel distance using fiber optics. And that's hard. And there's also mirrors that you can move. So basically a whole lot of convoluted engineering goes goes on where someone's fiddling ab about with, with the bits and pieces to match the travel lengths of all of the, the wave fronts to physically combine them. Yeah. When you think about, uh, say, light, whatever, 500, I forget what, you know, 500 nanometers, you've got light at that. What's that going green? I don't forget the exact number. So that is a billionth of a meter, 500 billionths of a meter. Now, yeah. if you want to change it to millimeters, it is five billionths of a millimeter, 
100 millimeters to the meter. And I'm doing this on my head. So anyway, we're close, right? So when when you've got that 1.3 millimeter wavelength that you have to line up the wave fronts perfectly, you've got a lot of play there, right? A gigantic 1.3 yeah. millimeter. Imagine, again, you know, the earth is turning, the mountains are, the tides are happening, trucks are driving by, things are changing the, the, sh the distance from your telescope to the object that you're trying to image, and you have to line it up to one five billionth of a millimeter to make it all line up. It's and so you just hard. hard is is a dramatic um, oversimplification of of what it is. Like it's super hard. Yeah. So that's that's why. And so that's why they do it with radio waves because they can. And and I'm sure we will see. You know, some of the bigger telescopes that are coming, the um, uh, the thirty meter telescope, the uh, Giant Magellan Telescope. The Giant Magellan Telescope, right, is seven separate mirrors that are all aligned and are acting kind of like an interferometer to pull their images together. Because, but they are bolted so that the light arrives right to the nanometer or to the five and and nanometer. the most impressive system we have working is, of course, the the very large telescope, which is an array of telescopes down in Chile. It, it's four multi-meter telescopes with a bunch of one-meter companion telescopes that they move around to fill out the resolution as they need. And, and that, that need to move telescopes around to fill out their baselines, you only get the resolution along the, the distance of those telescopes. So if you have your telescopes lined up, you're going to get fabulous in the rows part of your image and terrible in the columns part if you line them up just wrong. Yeah. And, and it's figuring out how to align everything perfectly to get the highest resolution that can be super annoying. And as you said, right, it's done with fiber optic cables. And you can kind of imagine they've got all the four telescopes all connected with fiber optics, dumping their live feeds into this one location, and then they are tuning – with I'm just imagining some knob, but I'm sure there's, you know, to watch the wavelength until they perfectly yeah. line up and then and then interfer interferometry suddenly turns these four telescopes into a telescope the size of the baseline as opposed to just the combined light from four telescopes. So and, and the process is called fringe finding and you can actually do this uh very simplistically on an optics bench with high school students even and you basically move physically around mirrors until you are able to combine laser light and get a beautiful diffraction pattern because you've lined up those peaks and troughs in the wavelengths right and so you can sort of you can see that it's happening but you have to be able to do it in real time. And without being able to do it in real time, you just you don't stand a chance. And the only right. place where you could build a large telescope, a large interferometer, is space. Where and, and there's a really interesting technology that I've heard. They're thinking about using light as a propulsion system to fine-tune your telescopes. Yeah. So they would your telescopes would fly in formation and then they would shoot flashlights off of themselves to thrust with photons until they're perfectly lined up. Uh, and so instead of having like little chemical rockets, they would be shooting flashlights in different directions because of the... And that's that's just the most meta thing ever where they're aligning the light by shining light to move themselves. To move themselves, yeah. It, I love it. I love the idea. So needless to say... It is uh, very complicated, but it is it is the future. Like we are going to see more and more of this interferometry as as we go. Larger instruments, better telescope alignment, better either post production on radio instruments. Like like again, half of this is what the target, and half of this is the work that they did to gather this image. is is an amazing yeah. accomplishment. It it really is, and we just look forward to seeing what this team continues to be capable of, of accomplishing 
and what scientific returns other than a very satisfying, yes, we had it right. I look forward to seeing what additional scientific returns come from this. And other things they could point at. I mean, this is just yeah. one interesting object. There are a lot of really interesting objects in the radio wavelength that they could point this worldwide collection of telescopes at. And maybe they could do that. They could they could aim for one black hole and then a different black hole and then another one because it could very well be when you look at just how big the the event horizon is in this image, they could go after much smaller objects. Maybe there's another 10 objects or 20 objects or 100 objects that would still give really meaningful insights to the science and, of what they're doing. And this kind of work can also be used to, to study the birth of stars. Titori stars are bright in the radio. That's actually what I got my start doing. We can peer into star forming regions and see how stars are coming together. So this is the kind of technology that can be used to define both the birth and death of a myriad of different objects. Well, we've reached the end of our time. Uh, so it's time to wrap things up. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching us today. Thanks, of course, Pamela, for uh, dropping the knowledge. Uh, what a week. Like I said, it I'm going to go for really a walk. Ha yeah, I'm uh, going to sleep so hard tomorrow. And for me, yeah. the Event Horizon Telescope was only at like 8 a.m. For you, it was 6 a.m. Yeah. So yeah, kudos I got an early for start. making it. Yeah, it was a, got an early start that day. We started working on our video immediately. So I started writing at like 6 a.m., 7 a.m., and we oh, got it geez. out before the you know before the end of the day, which was great. Um, but yeah, no, definitely time for a well a well earned rest. What a week! Uh, thanks to everyone watching the show this week. Thanks to all of our moderators. Uh, big shout out, of course, to our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are the fans, the producers of a lot of the stuff that we do. So if you want to be part of that great community, go to wshcrew.space, and they will uh, they'll hook you up. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we will see you all next week. And remember, Monday, Chad. I got to put the event up on my YouTube channel, but that's going to be happening. <laughs> so if you want to meet Chad, now's your chance. All right. We'll see you all later. Bye-bye.